Philosophy of Language podcast. Uh, we begin by, of course, uh, thanking uh, our beloved Dr. Professor Dr. Prasananshu for allowing us the opportunity to work on such an illuminating topic and giving us the academic freedom and the academic leeway to sort of, you know, uh, delve into the issues that are very interesting to us. So I, I'll do a quick introduction of the podcast, why we're doing it, and uh, what is the scope of our uh, in inquiries in this uh, uh, throughout the course of this uh, podcast. Of course, uh, philosophy of language has been interest uh, has been of interest to us in India as well as in the West, and you know there are many interpretations and many uh, uh, ways through which we can look at language, and they have invariably impacted the way that we understand reality itself because you know there is as many philosophers argue that you know our reality is in many ways um you know it, it's not separable from our language right everything that we think somewhere has the input of language come uh, language into it and uh, this way our entire reality in some way is constructed by how we understand language to work and and how how we how and what is the and how we employ language in our daily lives and also in our study of disciplines in our very various intellectual engagements so the 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 influence that language has is very ubiquitous and understanding language here in these cases allows us to sort of understand how the limitations of language how the nature of language influences the way we think and the limits to which we think so that this is why uh, you know the philosophy of language, of course, is uh, of great interest to us, and that is why we are doing a podcast. Uh, the way that we are going to proceed in this podcast is, of course, talking, uh, you know, taking various taking uh, talking points of various theorists that have existed and who have talked about language throughout ages, and you know, uh, uh, in India as well as the West, and you know, talk about what their view of language was, and in a way how that impacted our understanding of the world and specifically our understanding of the law because of course at the end of the day what we are doing is to uh, study the impact that the philosophy yeah. of language has, has had on law which is of course uh, what our discipline deals with uh, so we have uh, we have the main content is being divided into four parts in the first part we will be discussing the indian philosopher panini who uh, who uh, who worked in in second around second century bc and wrote one some of the most influential treatises on philosophy in existence uh one of the major being ashtadhyay which is which literally means eight chapters where he discusses his philosophy of language his ideas about grammar which are a a a, 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 a stock text for sanskrit scholars even today and and for the flaw and the students of philosophy of language even today and you know the work of panini has gone on to influence many philosophers even in the west for example ferdinand de saussure was uh, uh, was majorly influenced by the work of panini and also uh, the the impact that panini had was also felt in the linguistic theory to come many 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 millennia later uh, the second um, episode will deal with the philosophy of wittgenstein now wittgenstein uh, is a philosopher whose influence cannot be understated on philosophy most of the uh, western philosophy in the 20th century was somehow impacted by wittgenstein's work uh, his work laid the foundation of uh, positivism logical positivism and positivism in many ways impacted the entirety of our understanding uh, not only of law but also of sciences and you know is 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 one of the most dominant philosophies uh, guiding these disciplines even to this day so the work of wittgenstein cannot be understated and you know wittgenstein's ideas uh, of uh, of the limits of language and you know how our reality is fundamentally constituted by language itself is is a very important part of his philosophy and then of course we come to uh, the later uh, half of uh, wittgenstein's life and you know where he talks about uh, uh, how philosophy how 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 language operates and the language works in cultural context and how uh, and, and the concept of language games that is developed by uh, uh, by uh, by wittgenstein to understand how basically language uh, uh, language play how what kind of role language plays in our daily lives uh, in the third episode we'll be uh, we'll be delving into structuralism and the philosoph linguistic philosophy of Ferdinand de Saussure uh, Ferdinand de Saussure was uh, in many ways the launchpad for 
the philosophical movement of structuralism to take place um, the 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 notions that uh, that uh, the, the idea of sign was first uh, uh, first uh, theorized by Saussure in 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 his general course of linguistics where he talks about how uh, how the sign is is the way that you know in the entire language the entire language works the entire language is a process of signification which has a signifier and a signified right and it is to the interaction of the signifier and the signified that uh, that language is constructed and the relationships uh, so to speak between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary as in there is no uh, there is no inherent way as to why as to how the language uh, uh, you know refers to something that is out there in the real world language refers in a way to language itself and and uh, and you know in this way the meaning is constituted by the structure of language that is created through the web of meanings uh, and that is how the term structuralism comes about and in in the last uh, substantial episode we'll be talking about the philosophy of Jacques Derrida the the pioneer of the post structuralist movement who of course picked up from a uh, work of structuralist philosophers like Saussure and Claude Levi Strauss but also went beyond them and to argue how how uh, Saussure's and Claude Levi Strauss uh, uh, understanding of language was limited spatially and you know he talks about the con uh, the concept of difference as to how meaning is not only deferred but also deferred and you know he he also expands about his idea of deconstruction where you know he talks about uh, like you know the binaries that exist uh, within our understanding of of language and you know which he which he call uh, and you know our our uh, fundamental assumption in in western metaphysics uh, that all the all the ideas that somehow uh, uh, refer all all our philosophical constructions refer to not just to something that is constructed within language, but something that that appears out there that is not uh, you know constructed by language, which he calls the uh, the the fallacy of logocentrism, so to speak. And his entire project in deconstruction is to sort of come over the idea of logocentrism and 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 to sort of discover what has been always left on the margins of philosophy. So Derrida will, of course, be the conclusion of our uh, so the substantive part of our podcast, and and it will be a, a very very delightful journey, of course, for all of us, I'm sure. Uh, so let us uh, start our first uh, the substantive part of our first episode, uh, which is the discussion of on Panini, uh, and of course uh, the research report of Panini was drafted by my friend and colleague uh, Ananya Griyapadhyay. Ananya, kindly introduce Panini to us and tell us why do we care about him, what is the significance of his work, and so on. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Abhinit, for the wonderful introduction. So, Panini, um, I think all of us know him primarily as a grammarian uh, because of, as you said, his work, Ashtadhyayi. So, Panini was essentially a Sanskrit scholar and he was in ancient India. Now, we don't exactly know the time frame in which he was based, but uh, scholars believe he was between the 6th and 4th centuries BC. Now, um, he was in fact so widely renowned as a grammarian and a linguist that he was even called the father of linguistics by many sources, not just you know in ancient India or in India, uh, in contemporary India, but even in the Western world, he's widely renowned. Uh, and this is partly because he was a major influence on other linguists uh, across the world, uh, including those whom we are covering in this podcast, such as Sosher. So, uh, what exactly his contribution was, if I have to put it very simply, was that through his treatise on Sanskrit grammar, the Ashtadhyayi, he tried to cement the role of Sanskrit as the mode of learning or as the dominant language for learning for the entire Indian subcontinent. And this persisted for millennia until there was uh, the Mughal rule which brought in Urdu and Persian and established that as the language of learning. So as per Fritz Stahl, his theory of morphology uh, was more advanced than any other European scholar uh, and until as late as the 20th century AD. So coming to what morphology is, is essentially the study of words, word formations and word relationships. So as many many of our listeners may be knowing, Sanskrit is a language wherein you can, you words are not just uh, created without any basis. They often, like there is often combination of words, there's prefixes and suffixes in order to make new words. So if I can give a brief example, so you have the word khaga in Sanskrit, which means bird. And the, the logic is that kha means sky and ga means movement. So you created a word taking something like it means something which moves in the sky. 
and then you have uraga uraga means a snake and ura means the ground and ga against means movement so something which moves on the ground is called uraga meaning snake so these are the kind of language rules that he came up with and of course he also uh, formalized sanskrit and defined it very carefully in uh, talking about the grammatical rules so as we may as as many of us may know sanskrit is often called a perfect language and this is because its rules of grammar are very precise and very consistent there are rarely any inconsistencies in the language uh, so th this was this is largely uh, creditable to the works of panini so the ashtadhyayi essentially tries to define and preserve sanskrit as the uh, language of learning because it was the language of the vedas and therefore uh, panini's understanding was that the language which is so pure and therefore um, used in the vedas which is uh, the the which is uh, the connection which humans have with god or which brahmins had with god and therefore he felt that it could get corrupted unless it was codified and therefore this codification of language was very necessary and in codifying it he brought these algebraic rules like i talked about like there was uh, there is a proper grammatical structure to every word and to every sentence and he also said that if this language was not so codified then learning was impossible in other words he called it the sine qua non of learning that a proper language structure needed to be formed and at the same time he also prioritized brevity over clarity uh, which is to say that although the ashtadhyayi consists of nearly 4000 sutras to be precise uh, th uh, 3959 sutras it can be recited from end to end in less than 2 hours so now uh, uh, before we get into more detail on panini and his works on vyakarana i also want to talk about two other scholars uh, from ancient india who uh, who borrowed from panini but also diverged from him in significant ways so you have patanjali who was a sage in ancient india whose life is dated to the mid 2nd century bc and he was the author of the mahabhashya which means the great commentary so it's essentially a commentary on panini's ashtadhyayi but it goes beyond it and therefore some people refer to it as the first philosophical text that was laid uh, that was given by the hindu grammarians and he also quotes another scholar katyayana now in the so basically what uh, uh the like the trio of them taken together can be said to delve into philosophical issues related to language and uh, they in in doing so they preceded the darshanas now what are the darshanas they are the formalized philosophical systems that we have in the ancient hindu tradition um so before uh, before there were the darshanas there were the other uh, grammarians who tried to explore philosophy through language so that would be a brief introduction uh thank you very much ananya that was very enlightening and gave us an idea about uh, panini and uh, the type of work that he was trying to do and also uh, introducing patanjali and katyayan which with who are uh, you know important philosophers in their own right who of course borrowed from and also developed on the works of panini uh, um we, now we are uh, discuss, we'll discuss the works uh, of uh, the grammatical aspect of sort of uh, to speak uh, of panini's work uh which are part of his vyakran which literally means grammar in sanskrit uh, i think pranay uh, you would want to uh, share your insights about pa panini's vyakran please uh, go ahead yes thank you abhinay so uh, vyakran is a sanskrit word for explanation or analysis uh, it refers to the study of grammar and linguistics uh, and it is one of the six veda Uh, vedangas or science ancillary to the vedas it consists of grammar uh, grammatical analysis and conventions which are necessary for accurate language it is also related to the another vedanga called nirukta which the former seeks to establish uh, as the exact form of the words as a means to properly express ideas the latter dwells on etymology and the contextual meaning of words more specifically the latter holds that all nouns could be derived from verbal roots by a formal disagree panini's work is also one of the oldest surviving material on vyakarana uh, another scholar which was prith sal studied how uh, indian ideas influenced the work of european scholars on language he noted that the ideas of formal rules in language Uh, or what we call structural linguistics heavily borrowed their ideas from panini and later another scholar bhartran uh, and sasso himself considered him uh, that is panini the founder of modern structural linguistics 
uh, as a professor of sanskrit for over three decades and uh, explicitly credited panini uh, among his inspirations sasor ideas uh, were after that further developed by chomsky uh, meanwhile panini influenced many other great philosophers uh, uh, that came after his time which included charles his peers who was called the father of pragmatism or the of, uh, which is the idea that and thoughts that instruments for prediction and action rather than uh, how the mirror in reality uh, so they link panini to the tradition of uh, semiotics that is the study of noun uh, that denote a meaning that is not the sign itself uh, finally another philosopher that is Leo, uh, leonard dumpil uh, called panini the founding father of american structuralism uh wrote a wrote a paper on panini's roots so uh, another philosophical issues that are related to language uh, i think that will be taken by nitai nitai yes please uh, please enlighten us the philosophical aspects of the works of panini please go ahead um right so so um when we um want to understand the philosophical issues related to language and panini's interpret interpretation of that what we first need to recognize is the fact that panini's drive to structurally outline the, the rules that made up sanskrit had two main domains right so firstly panini regarded dialectics or what may be known as the variations or the differences in the usage of sanskrit across various regions oral traditions and written scriptures as subdomains of a single unified language and and secondly he insisted that sanskrit is atemporal which essentially means that it does not change with the changes in time right so further panini stated that the anjana or what we may know as the popular usage of a word was authority authoritative over whatever meaning could be derived theoretically or historically so as per panini uh excuse me as for patanjali the evidentiary value of the word is inherent and not so externally what this means is that the association between a word and its meaning is natural now to decide what constitutes this meaning patanjali looks into two different possibilities right so he looks into individual characteristics or generic properties shared by all members of an entire class and presented the arguments for both sides before finally deciding that the both of these must be included within the meaning so the only debate that here in rises is that which came first and which should be followed and this debate is expanded fully in the subsequent texts such as the mema samas so however what we must also recognize is that katayana and patanjali's com- commentary on panini's work was often brahmanical they said that sanskrit itself was sacred like the vedas and that proper usage of sanskrit produced punya or religious merit which would lead to prosperity after reincarnation they called vernacular usages degenerate descendants of sanskrit and born out of the inability of their speakers to speak proper sanskrit therefore the proper usage of usage had to be laid down and followed across gen- generations right right thank you that was very enlightening of course uh, there is of course a socio political um, dimension whether we are talking about the works of any philosopher and you know whether it be indian or western and you know, the way that they conceive ideas is very much influenced by the sort of socio politics of of that time and you know how how uh, how we look at the idea of 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 knowledge uh, in in its in specific domain but like that is a, a whole another discussion which uh, sort of uh, you know borders outside our area of discussion uh, so let's to to get back at uh, what panini was talking about uh, um you know uh, it may be of course maintained to a certain extent that panini was still more open to flexibility than katyayan and Pat- patanjali Now, for example, uh, you know, Patan, uh, Panini used the term prakri, you know, pra, uh, the prakriti, you know, meaning original or natural, to denote uh, a form of word before operations of grammar were performed on it. Right. So he used the method of auxiliary symbols, that is, using affixes to mark a grammatical derivation of prakriti across 
such as across tens and number and gender you know this method was uh, rediscovered for by a later philosopher named emil post and became a standard practice uh, in in design of computer languages and you know it is not a surprise that you know there are many fields which are sort of rediscovering the use of language in computer sciences and you know trying to uh, you know understand how you know our understanding of sanskrit as a formalized language uh can you know help us uh you know redesign the way that we look at computers and computer sciences so and meanwhile uh of course katyayan and patanjali preferred the term vikrat as opposed to prakriti uh, you know and vikrat means uh uh which means unnatural deformed for the new forms of grammatical transformation so and as per these scholars this reorganization rigidity by katyayan and patanjali was was a counter to the jains and buddhists who had begun their opposition to brahmanism by the 2nd century bce which is of course you know a, a sort of a political end you know uh, like a sort of strife between uh, um, you know what we traditionally consider as like you know the vedic brahmanic philosophy and you know counter movements that were coming up that is jainism uh, and uh, buddhism that were coming up in 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 many ways uh, you know as a social political opponent to brahmanism and brahmanism's brahmanism's hegemony over cultural life and you know there are many narratives of course uh, about how this entire issue panned out uh, some philosophers like um, some scholars like ambedkar of course argue that you know they look at the works of jain and uh, and buddhist scholars as a sort of a reformist movement which were sort of you know uh, against a counter revolutionary force of uh, brahmanism were meant to sort of you know uh uh was sort of meant to uh, uh uh um you know uh, to to basically work towards the masses and you know to reduce the hegemony of the brahmanical uh, brahmanical class and this is also uh, we 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 see this also in 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 buddhist and jain interpretation and usage of language right so buddhists for example do not use the the traditional uh, sanskrit which has been the language of a only you know particular class of people you know that is of course the brahmins uh, and you know it was not of course you know the, the normal public you know the gentry was not uh, the 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 plebeians so called uh, you know other castes were not the other varnas were not educated in sanskrit and it is and they used to communicate in works like pa, you know pali and prakrit and the buddhism sort of uh, you know uh, language lingual feature was that they interacted with these classes in pali and prakrit itself instead of you know using the more uh, um, um you know brahmanical version of you know uh, that is the sanskrit right so, so prakrit and pali were like you know this variations of sanskrit which were was spoken by the normal people and you know instead of the very formalized system that was uh, that was used by brahmanical scholars and you know uh, of that time so 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 there is of course a socio political aspect to all of philosophy not just uh, the philosophy of language of course so it will naturally flow a uh, flow into it and you know there is a, a wider uh, this is a wider movement that we see across uh, indian philosophy that you know much of the metaphysical aspects so to speak of our philosophy are very much guided by what the socio political material realities are that exist of the, at that time and you know the philosophy of language uh in ancient india was of course not an exception to this rule as we have seen just now so as per uh, patanjali's interpretation of panini the relationship between uh, the relationship between sanskrit words and their meaning is said to be established permanently by grammarians right and this is in contrast to of course you know the sociologist's idea of language as it, where the you know signifier and the signified the relationship between them is arbitrary rather than natural we will come and discuss that when we you know talk about our module about uh, uh, sociol and structuralism and you know the consequence of this uh, uh, permanent establishment of the meaning between the sanskrit word uh, you know sanskrit the permanent establishment of relationship between the sanskrit word and their meaning was uh, meant that the meaning of the world was therefore eternal or nitya right and so this uh, uh, so the eternality of meaning or the nityatva of meaning only existed in sanskrit and not in other vernaculars which of course you know like any other language evolved with customs and usage over time right which of course sosur calls the synchronic you know view of language the synchronic and diachronic divide between structuralism which was of course in in many ways picked up by sosur from panini and which is which we will have a good time reflecting on when we talk about uh, sosur and you know and of course discuss the influence that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that sosur had from panini 
so um of course this gave rise to the debate of how words could retain their meanings even after changing and yet comprise an internal language so there is this entire uh, you know dialectic between the eternality of language it's it's it, it's stasis in time and you know it's it's evolution through time and you know this is a conflict that is um that is of course sort of you know resolved temporarily by sasur but of course this resolution is of course again disturbed by the ideas of jacques derrida who talks about that there is no static view of language that can be taken and you know meaning is not only of course deferred in a system of structural uh, of a structural web of meaning but also deferred in time always so that is something that we will discuss when we talk about derrida um and to answer the question of our eternal internal understanding you know of of language as in uh, the way that panini patanjali and katyayan talk about it uh, we have to understand two concepts uh firstly the flexibility of individual sounds and their utterance as a process stretched in time instead of a momentary event panini had of, of course given the concept of sphota which is the explosion or the moment in which this uh, in which the sound is formed and of course patanjali talks about that the sphota is the equivalent of uh, the entire sound is the audible uh, uh, just audible for different durations this related to another issue that uh, that these scholars raised was whether the words can be understood as a string of sounds and therefore sentences as string of words right which all three of these scholars answered in affirmative but bahatri differed in this uh, differed slightly in this and he adopted a gestalt approach in saying that while the words may be defined in isolation it has meaning only in the context of the sentence now to explain what gestalt means the gestalt is the basic idea that the 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 uh, the whole is uh, bigger than the sum of its parts that is basically a gestalt right so when we say something like um, you know in an in an opera right there are many people who play different instruments each of them just know a part of a symphony but somehow when you put them together they know something called a symphony in its in its entirety so in this way the 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 sum of the entire you know the the the, the group in many ways is more than just the sum of its parts it constitutes something new which the sum of its parts never had right so this is what the philosophical idea of gestalt is and this is what bhatri is coming at right he talks about uh, you know how how meaning is is, is a gestalt and you know uh, and and you know the individual words in isolation do not constitute meaning it is only within the context of the sentence that meaning is construct, constructed so this entire idea that you know of course you cannot separate text from its context it comes from you know in in an indian indian tradition it comes from the ideas of bhatri uh uh and at the same time as we as discussed above panini stressed that all nouns cannot be derived from roots but some must be taken as as per their prevailing meaning and you know quoted uh, and where he quoted the meaning uh, which prevailed at the time uh, when the quoted text was written of course you know again the entire idea of text from context and and you know this is where uh, uh, you know this is the dimension where we explore the works of these scholars you know these very eminent scholars panini Pan, Patanjali, Prahatri, and you know the the influence, of course, that you know these scholars had is still felt today. Of course, not only in India but also in Indian scholarship, but also in Western scholarship. And it's very interesting to sort of you know take a, take a deeper grasp at, at at these issues and sort of look at how how our understanding of language was shaped by the ideas uh, espoused by these. Uh, um, uh by these uh, by these scholars so with this we come to the end of the substantive part of the uh, part of our podcast today i'd like to just uh, hand over to my colleagues to just give closing remarks about you know what they felt about this discussion and what they understood and you know what we can do in the future ananya please go ahead yeah thanks abhinit so i think my take away from uh, reading panini and listening to the uh, discussion is that um, it 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 offers a rather so it's what i like about this discussion was that it wasn't it necessarily isn't about sanskrit it's more about how having a formalized language that's also used in the real world as in in a very it's not like a computer language that's only used by computer scientists rather it was a language that although it was used only by a restrictive class or caste of people it still was used in the real world and yet they try to ma maintain uh like as you said nityatva that is it it's eternal and it does not change with time so the evolution uh, i mean the the discussion of how uh, a static language can still lend itself to philosophical discussion and like the like the relationship between linguistics and philosophy i think this gave a very um 
like it, it's a new perspective because I don't think it's there in a lot of languages around the world that you codify it and you keep to it very strictly without uh, evolving to people, you know, the changes in pronunciation that occur when people from abroad, uh, like, you know, uh, seafarers come to the country or the changes when new groups start migrating in from the north. So Sanskrit stood the test of time with regards to all that, primarily due to the efforts of the uh, aforementioned trio of grammarians. So I think this was a this was an interesting perspective to have in discussing linguistics and philosophy. Thank you, Ananya. That was very enlightening indeed. Uh, Pranay, please share your thoughts. Uh, I think uh, what I almost understand uh, from this discussion is that uh, Pani was from like third or fourth BC. Uh, his his contribution in philosophy on language is still uh, her day, and uh, there is very uh, like. Uh, from 20th, uh, 20th century Europeans also see his uh, contribution as a great one. And uh, I think just his impact on uh, language and how Sanskrit from the basis of uh, many other languages uh, today uh, is greatly like inspiring to hear. Okay, thank you, Panin. Uh, thank you, Pranay. That was, that was also very insightful. Nitai, please give your closing remarks. Uh, right. So just adding to what you and Pranay and Ananya has said, um, another thing that I found really interesting from the discussion was the varying perspectives, right? So we didn't see one static field of thought or one static stream. Different philosophers during this time had various widely different interpretations on Sanskrit as a language we saw in the case of Patanjali, Katayana and Panini. So um, it just shows the diversity and again, the effect on the for, on the philosophers and the linguistic philosophy to come. So yeah, that's my closing remark. Thank you, Nitai. With this, we come to the end of the first episode of our podcast. We discuss the works of Panini, Patanjali, Katyaya, and Bhatri, and all the uh, all the and the entire scholarship in the field of linguistics in ancient India. And in the next uh, episode, we'll of course be talking about the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who, as we discussed, was an immense, immense influence on uh, on not only the philosophy of language but the entire field of philosophy and thought itself. And you know, and all all the basically natural as well as formal and human sciences. It's, it's, it will be a pleasure to talk about them. Uh, thank Thank you, uh, Ananya, Pranay, and Nitai for, uh, for this uh, wonderful, wonderful discussion. And we'll all see you in the next episode. Thank you very much.